Yeah, welcome to an Electron Dance uh, video interview with Douglas Wilson um, of uh, Die Gut Fabrik, who uh, appears to be jet lagged as he just travelled back from the US. <laughs> So, Doug, welcome. Thanks. To your own home. Yeah, that was really nice of you. Okay. Um, so you're, you're back in Copenhagen finally after, you've said how many months you... I have, um, I'm not, a, I'm not quite sure, uh, I'd have to think about it. I, um, I've spent a lot of time in North America in the last uh, year, so I was on sabbatical in Canada and California last fall and I've been, um, since GDC, traveling around uh, America for another month and a half. So, um, yeah, I've been weirdly out of the country for a while. You took me um, around yesterday to ITU. Yeah. And uh, everybody was playing um, all sorts of games there, but you put me through hooker, <laughs> which, but today I'm, I'm feeling better. So, I, it's, it's like, a, it's, um, it, you couldn't make this up, right? Like, I, I swear I didn't, that, that I was as surprised as you that we just got there and there were like <laughs> tons of people playing Hokra. Like that was amazing. I think we just played two games and most of the time I wasn't sure. Oh, hang on, that's not me. That's not, I'm looking at the wrong thing, you know. But very quickly, you know, my wrist was, I was constantly pushing around. Moving, so moving. I think the key is like, at least for me, I get so into it that I'm like pressing way too hard. So I think part of it is just to like have this zen attitude and really relax on the controller. Yeah. Um, but it is also since you're like constantly moving back and forth, it's brutal. So it's just like this endurance thing, you gotta, you gotta train the hand, yeah. So Hoka was made for the No Quarter yeah. uh, exhibition. Um, but, so I didn't know it wasn't like free to download, but like uh, Nidhogg isn't, isn't actually at That's right, as well. Nidhogg was another No Quarter. Yeah. yeah. This is this, um, yeah, uh, New York exhibit. But, which which means that the only time it's seen is just in these sort of like exhibitions and stuff and stuff like that. That's right. And then we, you were talking about yesterday how I mean it'd be great if you could find some way of yeah. of marketing it. Now how you kind of like market that or share that with people is the for me the the really the interesting question of the day. Um, okay, so it's based on this passing mechanic that uses this analog stick. So. It has to be played with a controller. Like you can't use a keyboard or an iPhone or something. Um, and okay, so like maybe he could release the build and just say you have to bring four Xbox controllers and plug them in your computer. But that that starts getting a little inaccessible or at least fussy and, and difficult. So you know that game is most at home on the console where you play it in the living room on a nice TV. But you know like he's not going to have an easy time publishing that game because it's such a minimalist uh, little sports game. And I think sometimes people, they judge based on what they see. So even though that might be a pretty elegant system that took him a while to tweak, people go, oh, what is this card? Which is just a bunch of like squares on the computer screen or whatever. Um, and so the challenge is to find, to, to put these kinds of minimalist, but in deeply enjoyable and deeply replayable games on the console, but, but figure out a way to sell people on the idea that these games matter and that they're worth the money and, and so forth and so on. Um, and yeah, so we have, we've, we've talked about this. I think there are, are various ideas. I would love to see Ramiro and a bunch of the people kind of um, team up together and release some sort of like crazy indie sports pack or something for PSN. I think that would um, that'd be one option. And so yeah, some of us have been talking about that. So, you know, one of these days you might might see something. I mean, there is Xbox Live Indie, but that's that's such a ghetto these days. I'm not sure. At that point, he might as well just release it for free on PC yeah. for, for the people who really want to run it. Because that sort of leads into the, um, it's the same problem as with Jags, which of course I have, haven't played. Yeah, it's a, uh, um, with this Joust game, that uh, it's, it's especially strange because you need these special motion controllers. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, something like the Move that has this big light at the end of it, because um, that helps signal a lot of gameplay information. That's but that's both the selling point and the it's and the challenge. It's this double-edged sword, right? Like it, the game feels refreshing because it's it's 
doing something new with this new technology. But as a result, um, you know, it's harder to distribute than a game that you can just like play with your keyboard or something. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, I'm also, again, I would, I'm desperate to share Joust with the world, and I know people are sometimes annoyed that people write about this game that they can't play or whatever, mm -hmm. but um, that's, that's really kind of a technological problem that we're trying to iron out. So um, yeah, you know, I would love to do a um, PSN release, and then someday I'd love to just release it on Mac, maybe even open source it. I think it's in the spirit of these... I wouldn't call Joust a folk game, but it's certainly inspired by those kinds of like um, playground games that are really easily modifiable. So yeah, that's the goal, just to hopefully sooner than later get it out there, encourage people to um, then modify it and, and add their own house rules and stuff. When you actually take Joust out into the streets of Copenhagen, yeah. like, what are you actually taking out? I mean, what is the... What's the device? Is it you taking someone taking a laptop or something like that? Because it depends. Uh, well, it's, it's always a laptop because right now it's running off of um, you know my MacBook Pro. So I have um, based on Thomas Pearl's um, Bluetooth library for the um, PlayStation Move. I made my own C sharp bindings, and so I have my own PlayStation Move library that just connects these controllers by Bluetooth to Mac OS X. So there's no like PlayStation Three involved, um, and so it's. My laptop, the people have the controllers in their hands. Um, for a more elaborate setup, we would bring um, a car battery and some really powerful speakers, because it's, it's important to hear the music. Um, more recently, like, we, uh, in New York, we just played a little bit in Washington Square Park, and in Boston, we played on the, the Boston T, the subway, which is great. Um, and for that, I uh, had two USB-powered speakers and they just rested on top of the computer. Um, I have this special plug-in that lets me actually um, close my MacBook Pro without ha having going to sleep. Um, and then I'm just walking around, like following the players with with the sound and, and the computers. It's pretty portable. Um, you know, eventually it'd be great to get it running off an even smaller computer, like a, a smartphone. And I don't even necessarily mean people playing with their smartphones, but you can imagine pairing these Move-type controllers to a small device so for like maximum portability. Because you're working on something called Spielplatz or something like that at the moment? Yeah. Um, is, that, is, that, is that a big mystery about that? No, you're still working it? No! Well, well, yeah, we're trying to work out what the time frame is. I mean, we have so much stuff we're working on that that's this kind of slow concept development right now. But yeah, the idea, the Spielplatz means playground in German. Um, so the idea is to do a bunch of these motion controlled, physical, full game esque small little projects for smartphones because we're all okay actually i'm not i don't even have a smartphone but a lot of us are walking around with music playing accelerometers uh i mean and not just accelerometers but you know all sorts of other um functionalities you could maybe imagine using mm -hmm. um and i think it'd be nice to do a whole series of these really small just like games um for you know android and ios so yeah eventually we're gonna um I almost imagine it as kind of like a label or like a sub label. Um, so I don't think any Spielplatz games are going to come out like next month or something, but yeah. certainly um, looking to the future. Last night, um, you took me through my first few games of Space Odyssey. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, a bunch of us were all pretty tired, so that I think in the end we were still kind of, I think we got the, the, got the concept of it, but I didn't think it turned into the sort of like chaos which. Uh, experienced players turn into when you do get stuck at this right. chatting. I think it was more like, what do I do with this? Do, can I can I can I press the A button? <laughs> but you felt a little stressed, right? Yeah. Like so, there's time is ticking, and you're trying to make these decisions, and like you know, inevitably we kept making the wrong decisions, yeah. right? Maybe so. I should I just explain Space Alert is a board game, and it's supposed to be a co-op board game, um, and. It's all down to a time limit. The time limit is basically what makes the whole thing work. Right. Uh, you've got like your standard game. It's ten minutes, and then um, the actual enemies that are going you're going to be facing or whatever get unveiled you know, as as time goes on. With you pick up a card, here's an enemy, and during this time you all have to work out how you're going to respond to this and what moves you're going to play out. It's essentially like like you said, it's it's like mapping out a programming algorithm. How how your character is going to move around the board to fix all the problems as the time moves forward. So at the end of 10 minutes, you then say, okay, what did we actually, how do we actually do? And then you play through every single step that you plotted. 
and then discover that people got their cards wrong or you miscommunicated or didn't realize the shields were missing and find out that your entire spaceship was blown to pieces. That's right. Uh, so, yeah, it, we, we went, eventually came with the full rule set, right, the last game. Yeah. I would say with, a, so we were only playing with four players. With the fifth player, there's even more enemies and more to coordinate. And I think that's when it becomes a real, because even with four, I could kind of eye what was going on. But yeah, I, re I really enjoy when that game uh, devolved into a kind of mad yelling match or something. Like just, ah, I, I need energy at turn four, ah, make sure it happens and stuff. Uh, but I love that game. It's it's one of my for sure favorite games of the last few years. It almost seems like it's a. It looks like a game for Doug Wilson. It's really? Like, lots of shouting and screaming. Yeah, that's and right. Activity. It just needs a little like wrestling or something between rounds or something. I think probably you need to have some downtime after you need to play Proteus or something. Right. right? That's right. So, so in terms of Space Alert as 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 game design, do you think that something could be lifted from that in terms of you know just general video game design? I think absolutely. I think. I think a lot of things. The first thing that occurs to me, I, I really um, adore how strangely multimedia it is. So that game has no respect for these classic boundaries. It's just really weird. It's this board game, but it's real time, and there's an audio CD. Like, and so it's just really, on the surface of things, it's this really awkward mix of different media. Like, you might say, oh, why isn't it just a computer game then if it's going to use? But that's. That's actually what makes it fun, this really strange and clunky mix of different media forms. And so I think there's, there's sometimes a desire that all these different media forms need to combine into some sort of like beautiful meshed whole. But I actually really like these, this kind of like collage aesthetic where we're going to take this traditional form, but then like throw in an audio CD or something. So that, I like that collage aesthetic to it. But then mostly just, um, you know, this realization that co-op games are super fun. But they're especially fun when it, it tries to create some tension between the people working together, right? So there is this like time stress and we have different opinions and we need to coordinate, but that's not easy. Yeah. I mean, that's also to me, to some extent, the story of Hoker, right? So the genius of Hoker is that it's a two-on-two -two game. So that unlike a one-on-one -on -one game, you're coordinating with some partner. Uh, and that sometimes goes horribly wrong, right? Where you and your partner are on a kind of different page and you end up losing because you, you weren't really following the game plan. And I think that that whole team dynamic is a little um, underexplored, at least by indie games. And uh, you know, especially the two versus two, like you know, Bridge, for example, this card game is a famous card game that millions of people uh, around the world are playing. And I think that's, that's not so surprising because that two on two dynamic is a really satisfying one. Um, or at least that dynamic of being in a stressful situation and having to like work it out with a close teammate or something. Um, so for sure I'd love to see even more um, indie games doing that, capturing that kind of dynamic. And to actually get out of this room you need to use the bouncy power, which is the S, no the X button. Right? X button. So you need to, basically you need to transform the twist between these two characters. Sorry, I'm just actually enjoying bouncing. Ah. That's, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. It has a nice feel to it and the, I don't think the other Knut games had swearing no. in did they? <laughs> wow. Not before this one. It's interesting. Uh, the graphical style is quite different. Yeah. And um, I feel like a lot more uh, conversations. Yeah, you haven't found a quest yet. <laughs> <laughs> Alright Doug, so I want to finish with just a rapid fire round of 20 questions. Deal. Uh, give me the answers as quickly as you can, and if you can't, then give them as slow as you can. Deal. Uh, uh, let's start off then. Do you have, ever have time to play anything like Mass Effect or Skyrim? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully in the coming months, but for the last year, no. The tower defense, yay or nay? Nay. Uh, what is your game of 2011? Proteus, for sure. Not even... Yeah. Uh, what was your game of the last two weeks? Can I say Proteus again? Uh, <laughs> you can. So the real answer to this question is Zero Space, which is a nice um, two to four player, weird space, multiplayer, indie shoot-em-up 
deathmatch thing. From it's great. Techno, techno pants. pants. Yeah, this guy in Los Angeles. What was Pippin Bar's game of the last two weeks? Like, I have to guess what he picked? Yes. Um, that's really interesting. I bet he picked his own game, right? Um, so, ex epic saxophone game. Played a lot of punks. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's right! No! <laughs> uh, will we ever see uh, Johann Sebastian Faust, where you make a pact with the devil with the move control, when the move control turns red? Yes. That's good to hear. <laughs> what is the difference between DS and prototype in one word? Prototype or proteus? Prototype. What's proto- like, all, any prototype? Uh, what's your favorite novel? Novel? Mm. Um, Mark Twain, uh, Huckleberry Finn. Is the Doug Wilson answer to Where Is My Heart actually America? <laughs> uh, <laughs> e kind of. Uh, it would be San Francisco, or the Bay Area, so it would be a part of America. Yeah. Are you telling me you left your heart in San Francisco? I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you like coffee? No. Uh, so I want to have a coffee because I'm thirsty. Okay. Ah, oh, that's pretty good. Thank you, Nicholas. Oh, you're welcome. Um, do you suspect Pippin Bar is actually frightened of you? Yes. In fact, I know it. Is Doug Wilson a meme? No. Who is your favorite male video game character? The mountain climber in Dirt. The mountain climber in Dirt. Yeah. Uh, what about your favorite female video game character? Uh, the protagonist Kai from our upcoming game, Mutase Ome. So Kai, Leah's been dancing for me. Do you want to dance for me too? No, I'm going to dance a little bit. Okay. I'm going, I'm going to dance a little bit. What is your favorite game spell? Electron dance. Oh, amazing. Yeah, that's, but that's real. I'm not just saying that. Just like that so. <laughs> that's right. I think everyone else was sucking up to me, but you actually sounded genuine. In your next experimental game, do you think it's possible you might actually kill somebody? Yeah, no. No. <laughs> I think that that's incorrect. You may kill Pippin Bar after recently failing to assassinate Stephen Tatilla of Kotaku. That's correct. Could you ever see yourself working on an FPS? Sure. I, th that's the thing. Like, I'm interested in a whole diversity of games. So yeah, why not? I would love to see the Doug Wilson FPS. Okay, Richard <laughs> Started, so I'll finish. Richard Hoffman or Tim Schafer? That's a mean question. I know it is. Um, I think you have to go with the underdog, right? So I'm going to go with Richard. Oh, yes, well done. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's the end of your questions, and you have scored enough points. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Oh.